Hi, everyone. Welcome back to One Sustainability here on day five of our conference. We're joined now from Mexico City uh, by uh, Daniel Roy. He is the partner. Uh, he's partner at AVG Group. And his topic this afternoon is climate tech le leading sustainability progress, as we can see here from the slide. Dan, welcome. Uh, let, let's hand it off over to you. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Glenn, for the introduction. And thanks to all of you for joining this presentation. Today, I will be expanding on the topic of climate tech leading sustainability progress. But first, let me give you a little bit of background on myself and on AVG Group. Even though I originally studied electrical engineering, I later shifted my focus to finance and sustainability. At present, I am one of the partners at AVG Group, which invests on climate tech with a focus on Norway and the Nordics. We are a member of the Principles for Responsible Investment of the UN, and we are considered a dark green or Article 9 fund, meaning we comply with SFDR, or Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, Article 9. An Article 9 fund under SFDR is defined as a fund that has sustainable investment as its objective or a reduction in carbon emissions as its objective. 100% of our investments fall within this category. As part of the process we follow to analyze possible investments, we not only take into account the direct impact that the company's product has on, an, on the environment and on sustainability, but we evaluate the full impact the company has as a whole. For example, we think it would make no sense to invest in a company that produces solar power, but that uses solar power, power <coughs> panels that were produced using child labor or that uses solar panels that have a short lifespan and will become non-recyclable waste. It is important to consider the impact that all aspects of a company will have in our environment. You may ask why we concentrate in the Nord region. Well, you could argue it is because most of our team is Norwegian or from Nordic descent, but that is not the main reason. As you may know, Norway is one of the most advanced countries in the world regarding to sustainability, climate tech, and clean energy. It currently produces over 98% of its electricity using renewable energy. Over 84% of vehicles sold this year were electric, while in the US that number is only 6%, and in Europe as a whole it was 11%. As a simple comparison going forward, the government in Norway has a policy in place that calls for 100% of vehicles sold by 2025 to be electric as opposed to the US setting a target to achieve 50% of vehicles to be electric by 2030. Norway was an early adopter and therefore an attractive test bed for climate related technologies. Thanks in great part to huge government support that started over 15 years ago, Norway has become the Silicon Valley of climate tech. The Norwegian government, which has the largest sovereign fund in the world, actively supports innovation in this sector through several government funds, which provide grants and favorable loans to companies. I consider government support and involvement a crucial part into reaching sustainability goals anywhere in the world. Providing important tax credits and offering benefits for utilizing renewable energy has been at the core of the success of countries like Norway. At AVG, we recognized early on that one of the main challenges the world was facing in regards to reaching its sustainability goals had to do with the lack of renewable energy, large scale new technologies required to reach net zero. These past few years, we have seen an explosion of new technologies coming out of the Nordic region, which we believe will be instrumental in the progress of sustainability. Our Nordic ESG and Impact Fund has invested in several leading climate tech companies which cover a broad range of technologies contributing to decarbonization and the sustainability of our planet. Just to name, name a few in, in this slide, you can see Alternus, which is in distributed solar, Nord Solar, which is also in distributed solar, Nor Hybrid in distributed wind, Arbaflame, which helps in the coal transition, Greenstat, which is mainly in hydrogen, hypothermics um, in biomass, and Clean Bay in biomass. 
To support our fund companies, we currently offer insurance options, which can mitigate technology risks by offering protection of principal, interest, and return of equity to investors. This not only secures cash flows, but also lowers the cost of capital over time. Additionally, AVG has created a carbon credit, credit trading platform, which, help its, which helps its portfolio companies monetize their carbon credit in an efficient way. To give you some examples of the climate tech innovations that will help us reach net zero and a sustainable planet, let me present a few of our portfolio companies. To start off, I wanted to show you hypothermics. Hypothermics develops and supplies compact biotechnological facilities that convert organic waste into renewable energy, such as biogas, fertilizers, and protein mass. But they do this in a significantly faster way than other solutions on the market. Hypothermics uses a type of bacteria obtained from heat sources, such as underwater volcanoes. This bacteria is used in reactors, which can convert the biomass into biogas or protein in a matter of hours as opposed to days. The process can be up to six times faster, but it can also yield up to 50% more biogas than a regular process. Um, Arbaflame is another of the companies that, that, that we have on our portfolio. And as you may know, coal fire plant, power plants are one of the main polluters and contributors of CO2 to the atmosphere. Currently, they produce 6 billion tons of CO2 a year. Just one 500 megawatt plant produces 4 million tons of CO2 in a year. The world needs to rapidly reduce these emissions while still maintaining a reliable baseload to the electric grid. Arbaflame manufactures what is known as a black pellet, which is used to substitute coal, but emits 90% less CO2 than, than coal while having a similar energy content. In the display, you can see the pellets, which we called um, black pellets, um, and, and that can substitute the, um, the regular coal. Arbaflame's black pellets are made from sawdust obtained from sawmills practicing sustainable forestry. These pellets can be co-fired with regular coal and retrofits required in existing coal fire plants would cost five to $10 million, as opposed to retrofits required for burning white pellets or other fuels, which can cost 100 to $500 million per plant. Clean Bay Renewables is one of our other investments in the US. Uh, sustainability processing waste is one of the big challenges facing us at the moment. Clean Bay Renewables naturally reuses byproducts from the poultry industry to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Clean Bay uses chicken litter and converts it to natural gas and organic fertilizer. There are 9 billion chickens raised in the U.S. annually, which produce 14 million tons of litter. Uncontrolled litter releases nitrous oxide, a greenhouse gas with 300 times the impact of CO2 and produces nitrogen and phosphorus runoff, which lead to algae bloom that pollute our waterways. Clean Bay Renewables is currently developing a network of anaerobic digestion and nutrient recovery facilities. At full capacity, each plant will recycle more than 150,000 tons of chicken litter annually into renewable natural gas and natural fertilizer and can reduce greenhouse gas emissions by up to 1 million tons of CO2. Greenstat is a Norwegian renewable energy and technology company. Their main focus is on energy production, such as wind and solar power, and on the production of the energy carrier hydrogen. Hydrogen will be an important part of the future's energy mix to achieve emission-free emission transport on land and at sea, cover the increasing energy demand, and to be able to decarbonize several industrial processes. Hydrogen and ammonia, which is a byproduct of hydrogen, differ from traditional energy production, mainly because they are not a source of energy, but an energy carrier that allows the transport of energy in a usable form. 
Hydrogen and ammonia can be used for propulsion and heating. Current transport vehicles use mainly batteries as a source of energy. Unfortunately, current technology in this field is not powerful enough and it does not have the required capacity to power large transportation vehicles like cargo ships. Hydrogen and ammonia have the capacity to power these vessels. Considering that 90% of the world's trade is transported by sea, and considering that cargo ships emit about 1 billion metric tons of CO2 per year, substituting fossil fuels for hydrogen or ammonia operated ships will be critical for a sustainable future. Another company with a very interesting product is Nor Hybrid, uh, based also in Norway. As you may know, there are several types of wind turbines av available in the market, with the most common one being the horizontal axis turbine, which is shown in the middle of the slide. Nor Hybrid has created a vertical axis turbine that can generate wind power more efficiently than ever before. It has been designed to be integrated with the urban landscape and it combines high efficiency with low energy costs. Nor hybrid turbines are silent and compact enough that they can be placed in rooftops or even urban settings. They can also be placed within existing solar parks. Thanks to the fact that wind will usually be available during periods when the sun is not, the energy producing capacity of these installations is increased significantly by installing the vertical axis turbines together with solar or other technology, power producing technologies. Besides the specific portfolio companies I described, AVG is also involved in a series of other climate tech ventures. For example, a very interesting area is micro hydro. When we think of hydroelectric plants, we usually think of large dams with large capacity hydroelectric electric turbines, which can deliver up to five or even 20 gigawatts of power. Unfortunately, most large scale hydroelectric projects require building dams that seriously impact the environment and can take years to develop. As opposed to these plants, micro hydro installations, which usually generate between one and five megawatts, can be installed with a minimum to no change to a river's ecosystem, as these installations do not require a dam. Um, Microhydro is quite popular in Norway and in some other parts of the world, but it still has not made it to places like the US. An additional example includes geothermal energy, an energy which does not emit greenhouse gases and is available everywhere 24 seven. Very deep geothermal energy wells, which are drilled down to five or 6,000 meters, can be dug almost anywhere in the world. They have a life expectancy of over 50 years and can be used to produce heating and electricity with very attractive economics. Also, a lot, a lot of opportunities are coming up in carbon capture. This new technology offers a turnkey product to capture carbon emissions while also producing sustainable food grade CO2. Considering that landfills are now forbidden in Europe, all waste will need to be incinerated or recycled, which can produce large amounts of CO2 unless carbon capture technologies are used. This has opened a huge market for companies offering this technology. Let me now talk a little bit about batteries, which is one of the areas that is of significant importance for the future, for, for the future event of the energy transition. Currently, the main sources of renewable energy are wind and solar. Unfortunately, both of these sources, resources cannot produce a constant power output and vary greatly by time of day, the climate, and the time of the year. In order to be able to provide clean energy during periods of time when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow, batteries or similar sources of energy storage are required. In the transportation sector, electric cars run on batteries. Just analyzing the U.S. market, think about the fact that currently less than 1% of the 250 million cars in the U.S. are electric. If we are to reach the goal of having 50% of these cars to be electric by 2030, that will require over 125 million new electric cars to be produced within the next seven years, and that is only in the U.S. Just imagine the amount of battery power we will need. We're seeing great advances in this field with several new types of battery and energy storage systems coming online. 
I could go on for hours describing hundreds of new technologies that we have seen or are seeing as part of our pipeline of possible investments. I do believe we are living in a time of great change, especially in the renewable energy sector. This is opening wide, a wide range of opportunities, which we believe can provide solid financial returns for investors. We have seen, and, and, and we think that the funds that we're involved with can produce uh, returns of over 20%, while at the same time contributing to the greater good of our planet. Climate change is a reality, which we cannot longer ignore, and it will be critical for our generation, and more importantly, for the generations to come to aggressively pursue the implementation of climate technologies that will make our planet a sustainable environment for generations to come. I'll stop right now. I thank you for your time and hope some of the things I have presented have been of use to you. In the presentation, you will find my email, so feel free to contact me directly with questions or inquiries regarding the presentation or our investment fund. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Nice, nice job. Terrific, terrific presentation. Some some really impressive portfolio companies there. They're doing Thank some you. they're doing some great stuff. And twenty percent return for the greater good. Who's going to argue with that? <laughs> Definitely, right? <laughs> Absolutely, right. Hey, on on the uh, on the Nordic stats that you that you talked about, the electric vehicle percentages and and the renewables. Those those were very those were very substantial, especially in contrast to say the U.S. and Europe. Is it? Is it what from a you know at, attributing it to it? Is it mostly? Is it is it mindset? Is it government partnerships? A little bit of both. Um, I, I think that there are three main factors that have contributed to this. Number one, um, Norway has always had a, a a focus on sustainability and on natural resources. And even though they're they're an oil nation, I think that many years ago they realized that the future was in renewable energy, not in oil. So most of the resources that the government has uh, invested in, in, in sovereign funds and in, uh, in programs that they currently have, they've, they've used all these programs to try and, and nurture uh, sustainable um, uh, ventures and, and clean energy. So they, they, they have a lot of, of, of investment from the government that, that, that is targeting this kinds of investments. On top of that, the government has gotten involved from a very early stage in, in setting a lot of incentives for, for, for persons to actually switch to renewable energies and, and clean energy. Um, you can drive on bus lanes if you have electric cars. You don't pay tolls or you, 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 um, uh, you don't pay any taxes on your cars if, if you have an electric car. You have special parking places. All of these things have made, you know, nowadays it's, it's, it's even cheaper to have an electric car than to have a gas operated car in, in, a, in a country like Norway. So um, thanks to all of this, people have embraced all of these new technologies. And, and it, it's a combination of having a society that is uh, highly educated um, and, and does embrace new technology easily. But it is critical to have the, the government actually push this uh, through investment and through policies that uh, favor renewable technology over uh, more dirty or, or or old fossil fuel technologies. Thank you, thank you. You had also up, um, and I'm an alum, so it caught my attention. You had you had the reference to KPMG. Oh yeah, up there. Uh, you know, one of the one of the issues you often hear with sustainability or CSR reporting and integrated reporting is really the auditing of the numbers, right? The statistics. Right. It, it almost, if you've ever done, and obviously you have, but if we've, you know, if you ever go through like the comfort letter, part of a financing with an investment bank, right? Where I want comfort on every number in the spot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, how do you, again, not not knowing how how they go about it, or or really the details behind the work they're doing? I would think that's from a you know from a credibility standpoint and kind of a, you know, a nice shot in the arm that that having some sort of attestation. Would be important. What What do you think, or or do you happen to know the types of work that they may be doing in that area in order to issue the reports they do? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think we we think that it's critical to have, uh, as you say, attestation and have third parties verify um, what companies say that they're doing, or or especially on investment funds and, and private equity, but also the companies themselves um, to be audited. We work with a company called Rio 
which basically produce ESG reports for us. And, and these are actually verified by KPMG and all of our financials and information is also verified by KPMG. So we, we run um, a, a, a pretty tight ship as to verification and, and reporting. Uh, from the moment we start analyzing companies, we, we involved uh, Rio uh, to check on their ESG um, compliance and but we're not we 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 don't only check on on how they are right now but we we do um quarterly re, uh, revisions and and reports for each one of the portfolio companies in which we show on each one of the variables of e s and g how they were in the last quarter and how they are right now and what how they they've advanced on each one of them so we give our our investors a a, a report which actually even shows how many tons of co2 have been saved from uh, being emitted to the atmosphere on, on, on a yearly basis with their investment, how many homes have been powered, um, a lot of statistics that actually uh, make you uh, grab very easily uh, the, the, the impact that your investment is doing with, with the companies in the portfolio. But it is critical to have all of these uh, third-party verifications because, you know, as you say, there's a lot of greenwashing in some funds and uh, in, in in other areas, and just to say that 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 you're investing in ESG um, doesn't actually mean that you're doing a, a greater good or or, or improving uh, the sustainability of the planet the way that that we would want it to. Yeah, we've had some presentations over the course of the week where people would put up, and here's an example of somebody who says it's an ESG portfolio and you, and you look at the names and you can't help but like really <laughs> <laughs> totally yeah we've seen that quite come a back, bit come back and shake uh, shake your head the um it was i found interesting the slide uh, that you had in, with the poultry i've actually mm -hmm. believe it or not um have worked on some let's call it chicken related projects uh okay. over, the, over the course of time and it's really interesting how that particular industry touches on you think about um fertilizer and grain and corn prices and and it really becomes uh that type of you know and there and as you said there's so many chickens that are that are raised uh, you know not only in the united states but worldwide, worldwide as an yeah. industry the the impact of of that cycle of that particular animal is is is, is really fascinating and it has a lot of uh, a lot of tentacles if you will it kind of touches so many different areas no totally no, I agree with you. I mean, as, as you saw on the slide, it, it is actually pretty circular because um, with the byproducts that you obtain from, from processing the, uh, the, the chicken um, litter, uh, you, you can actually produce um, uh, part of the food that's required to actually feed the chick chickens again. So it's, it's, it's a complete cycle and everything is, is actually reused in, in this process, which is, is fantastic for, for operations like this one. Now, on the government support side, I, I, I recall from one of the slides, you had you had grants, you had forgivable loans, and did they do any any particular like private placements as well, where the government actually takes like let's call it a preferred stock or something like that? Yeah, I mean the Nordic government has different different um, uh, programs and different uh, funds that they they have in, in order to to support all these kinds of technologies. Uh, like Innovation Norway, Investinor, Nisno, Norfund, each one of them operates a little bit differently. Some of them actually give you grants, and they're they're simple grants for invest, you know, um, for investigation, R and D, or or different kinds of uh, development um, to companies that are from an early stage startup or or growth companies. Um, they they sometimes are combined with um, very favorable loans in which you know as long as you're complying with what you should be complying, they can extend the period of the loan, the, the, the interest rates are, are pretty low, and, and there are several characteristics that make it very attractive on, on these loans that some of these funds are, are giving. But at the same time, they also have um, some of the, the Norwegian funds co-invest with us, like most of the, the investments that we have done have co-investment from the Norwegian government. And, and, and they do invest um, in similar or, or the same uh, way that we do, we invest. We, you know, they, they come in either through a convertible note or through straight equity, the same way that we would. And some of these funds actually, you know, even though they're, they're government funds, um, are showing returns of, of over 20% uh, on their portfolio. And they're actually operated as if it was just a regular private equity portfolio uh, from a private uh, group of investors. 
So there are several pro programs and, and programs, and each one of them has a different characteristic. And, and some of the, the companies that we're involved with actually tap into two or three of these programs, depending on the stage and and um, and, and what they're doing. It's got to be it's got to be helpful from 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 a, again developing or working on working on research and having having the funds made available, yeah. Um, without having to worry about okay, well, you know, we can only progress the next two weeks as opposed to you know having a little bit long term vision. I also thought it's interesting you said about the uh, the statistics and and measuring them. You know, in in a typical public company world, right? We always go quarter to quarter, uh, yeah. and we think about some of the some of the changes in, in some of the critical statistics. Involving involving sustainability, it, it's interesting that um, you know from an analytical standpoint to be, have that available. What what a, what a, what a, what a, what a helpful way to continue to track progress. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I for think sure. it is good to to always stay on top of this and and not wait for like a yearly report or something like that. Right. Absolutely. Well, listen, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you for joining us uh, today here at One Sustainability. Great. Great job, Daniel. Uh, Daniel Roig from uh, the AV uh, AV AVG Group. Thank you for your, your presentation. Terrific, terrific work. Uh, and we appreciate all of your insights and expertise today. No, thank you for the invitation. And um, I hope everyone has a great day. Look forward to seeing you next time. Same here. Take care. Thank you, Dan. Bye. Bye-bye.